Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are so excited to be here with you painting oil landscapes. Yeah, hi. Looks like we have people from all over. This is so cool. Thank you so much for joining us. That's awesome. Aust Austria, Austria, California. Saskatchewan. S that's really cool. Must be cold there. <laughs> yeah. <Must be> cold. <laughs> it's boiling here, so excuse me. I'm jealous. I'm very jealous. <laughs> we're, we're here with um, 12 inches at least of snow in Chicago, which I know is not as much as people got in on the East Coast. And again, in Canada, you probably have much more and Colorado. Sure. That's a lot. Speaking of around the world, though, what are you going to show us today? <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to show you how to draw landscapes based on a photograph that you found on this really cool app or um, website that I found called Map Crunch. You've probably heard of it already. So, um, Addy, would you share my screen? Yes. So you go to Safari on your iPad, and this is how I find my images that I'm going to paint for a landscape. And it basically just generates random places for you. So you just hit go and it will just generate random places. This one, somewhere in, I think, France. Uh, this one, somewhere in Germany. I don't know, it's not loading. Um, and then if you have a specific place that you want to look for, you hit options at the top. And then you can pick the country you want to go to. So I'm going to go to South Africa because that's where I'm from. Go. Oh, Western Cape. Ooh. Beautiful. I've been there before. And then if you hit map at the top, you can actually go to very specific oh. places. So the oh, town I that, that I cool. used to live is Port Elizabeth. Let's go and have a look there. Oh, this mm. looks. Oh, this is uh, the beach. At That's PE. beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is actually Jeffrey's Bay, a very famous surf spot. Anyway, so um, the place that I've chosen to paint today, I've actually got it over here. And Addy has a link for you in the um, in the chat. <clears throat> so if you just hit that link, it'll take you to this exact view. And then to save the image from this um, website, you hit the share button. And then there's a little arrow going down into a box, which seems to mean download universally. And you hit that, and then it will ask you if you want to download it. If your internet is faster than mine, it may work quicker. And then it will download it the same way it downloads all things on iPad. And then you just open it and save the image. Cool. And so this is what we're going to paint in Procreate. Fantastic. So we're going to head over to Procreate. Now, I've already drawn this already, just done the rough sketch so that I don't have to take you through that whole process. But basically, what you do is you open the spanner menu. I always refer to the spanner menu, and people don't know what I'm talking about. What do you call that menu next to the word gallery? Uh, the actions. Actions menu or under the wrench. Oh, wrench. Is that what it's called in American? Because I don't think spanners talk about spanners. <laughs> anyway, I know. So you go to I had the no wrench. idea what you were referencing when you said that. Spanner. You hmm. go to the wrench and then you hit canvas and you turn on your reference. Now, when you look at the reference pane, it's going to start by showing you the drawing that or whatever is in your um, canvas already. And it will be at the correct proportions of your canvas. So if you make your canvas the same size as the reference pane, you'll see the proportions are correct. However, if you press image, and now you want to import that image that you um, have saved. So we head over here. It will stretch it out. And that's not necessarily what you want. You actually want it to be in the same proportions as the image that you're going to ultimately draw. So let's move it here. You can see. The height is correct, but we actually want the width to be more similar to our canvas dimensions. 
So there we go, let's see. Okay, now that it, the reference pane is the right size, we can use two fingers in this pinchy motion to size the reference image and create a nice composition with it. And this is your opportunity to go, oh, you know what, I actually wanna just draw that bit or I like this, this bit over here. But I'm gonna do it like this. Cool. And so when you're framing it up, do you have in mind um, like the rule of thirds or do you just do um, whatever you want? <laughs> I do it a bit instinctively, but um, I, I try to keep a focal point in one of the four corners. So you don't necessarily want the focal point of your image or your finished painting to be right in the center. That can be really unbalanced and it can sort of it looks a bit amateur to have this massive focal point in the center that's why i've chosen to put that shiny you see where the light is coming through that's yeah. where your eye that's where your eye is drawn to in this image but, you yeah know, that's, okay so and you all frame the, that yeah and all of the lines in this image are heading off chips to that top corner so let's actually as a just experiment it would look a bit dumb to have it like this it yeah. i mean it, it it actually arguably it looks okay but but there is something artful about your placement before yes i I do. I, I think that when you make the focal point off to one side, off to the top or the bottom or the one of the corners, it's it's actually an easier composition to work with. Okay. Yeah, so and drawn... I was going to say I think there's a lot more motion in it this way because you get more of the the curve of the road, the yes. um, the power line, and those are both heading into the corners, which is very yeah. cool. Yeah. So I've drawn this, I've, I've taken a bit of liberty with making the road a little bit more humped and giving it a little bit more freedom in, in its proportions. But I mean, you can be very exacting if you'd like to. So just draw out a rough sketch. And then to set up your canvas, what, what we spoke about last time about these oil brushes is that there are five, uh, five packs in the oil brush pack the first one is just the oil brushes and the next four have a texture added which corresponds to the canvas texture that they come with in that pack so i'm going to use harold and i'm going to set up the canvas by choosing mid-tone gray going to the top layer and choosing my ta canvas texture brush and swooshing over the whole canvas. One of the questions yeah. that I know I see a lot is people asking how to get that realistic texture and yep. this is it. This is what's going to give you that yes. impact. Exactly. Then I'm gonna set that layer to linear burn and I'm actually gonna drop the opacity to 50%. So it's gonna give me texture but it's not going to be too in your face and fake looking. Oh, another thing, the size of this canvas. This isn't a 200 by 100 size canvas. This is a pretty big canvas. Um, and the reason I'm choosing a big canvas is because I don't want that canvas texture to be too big on the format. And if you choose a small canvas, the canvas texture will be sized appropriately and be huge. So this canvas is, let's see canvas information. It's 5,033, 333 <laughs> by 4,000 <laughs> pixels. I always work in pixels because if you work in inches, you have to factor in the dots per inch, which is the DPI. And it's very confusing for me. So if you work in pixels, you never have to worry about the DPI because you already know how many pixels you've got in your canvas. Agree. And because Procreate is a raster based program, it makes more sense to work in pixels because you'll get to a point where you're you're dividing them up or yeah. transforming them. Um, whereas 
in a vector-based program, maybe it does make more sense to work in millimeters or inches. Yeah. Yep. That's, I agree um, completely. Leanne made a good point. She said, uh, those who study photography composition will get the rule of thirds quickly, uh, but it may be unfamiliar as a guideline to those who are very new to composition. So should we really yeah. quick just talk about what the rule of thirds is? Because I think especially yeah. with landscapes, it's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, so if you have a landscape and you're looking at the horizon, don't put the horizon right in the center because it's going to be, the top half of your image and your bottom half of your image are going to be fighting for attention because they're the equal size. So decide what is more important to you in your image. Is the sky the part that you want people to think about and then just ground it with the land? So move the land down so that the sky takes up two thirds and the land takes up one third? Or is it the other way around where you want the land to take up two thirds and the sky to take up one third? And that also helps you decide how your composition is going to be in the end and what on the land is going to be your focal point or in the sky, et cetera. And um, when you were talking about focal points before, if you think about the, uh, dividing an image into thirds vertically, that can yeah. help you also figure out where to place the focal point, which here yeah. is the sunburst. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so once you have your canvas texture in and you have your sketch done, set the sketch to linear burn so that you can still see what's going on behind it nicely because linear burn is a transparent um, blend mode and drop the opacity so it's not messing with you every time you try and paint something. And then head down to Ooh. a layer underneath, yep. One more thing on the rule of thirds, Deb has a really good tip um, to open up the drawing guide and resize it. So within Procreate under the spanner menu, as Abby would say, or yeah. the wrench, you could go into canvas and turn on the drawing guide to, to help. Oh, show me that. Place it. That's a really good tip. So canvas, drawing guide, edit drawing guide, and the 2D grid, let's make this grid size humongous. And then that's roughly thirds. And you can see my sun is about there at the, um, sorry, I can't find. <laughs> it's in the top, what's that? Top right third. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, don't yeah. So that's a really good tip. I don't necessarily tip. want that on. Oh, no, not my reference. Come back. Uh, drawing guide. Okay. Um, with this little reference pane, it might irritate you if you've just started using it that sometimes you your finger might stray across it and whoops, it's moved the thing out of the way. And now you have to move it back or it's in the way and you want to move it around. Um, the place to move it around and, and get it to move without resizing is to put your finger, not your pencil, on the little minus sign right at the top of the little pane, the little gray one. It took me a mm. while to learn that, and I'm not going to apologize for my stupidity. Okay. <laughs> no, I've had that frustration <laughs> as well. Right. To, to start painting, I always start with a, a sloshy kind of brush, a bit of a wet mushy one. So I quite like um, blunt wet and blunt super dry. I know blunt super dry doesn't really sound squishy, but it is a little bit. Um, so let's go with blunt wet. Okay. And then I just squinch my eyes down while I'm looking at my reference to eliminate the distraction of detail. And then I just go in and paint the big blobs of color that I can see. So if you squish your eyes down, you can see a slash of green. You can see a sort of a, a wedge of dark green on the one side, a smush of sort of grayish green, some lumpy dark gray at the back. And we'll leave the clouds and do them on a layer behind. So let's just fill in the foreground and the, the predominant shapes. 
I quite like these brushes, the, the fact that they are um, color varying. So every time you lift your brush, you'll end up with a slightly different color. Yeah, and, and this one looks like it pulls the, the paint yes. underneath. It does, that um, because it's a, one of those wet ones. Um, it's got that sort of um, slipperiness. Now, I've made this um, color palette from the image. But what I did was I found that the color palette that I pulled directly from the image using the classic palette, add, new from photos, put the image in, boom. I'll do that actually and show you. See, the palette is a bit pooey. It's sort of browny oh. and sludgy. And so what I ended up doing was making a palette from another picture, which is this one down here, number four from the top, plus one from the, a couple of colors from the one above and colors that I got from the image itself. So don't be afraid to kind of create palettes from palettes that you've pulled in because you're not satisfied with exactly what the palette looks like that you've made. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that those palettes in Procreate are only 30 colors and there's thousands yes. and thousands of colors within the image. So it can only pick so many um, and it might exactly. not be the ones you want. And if it picks the dominant colors, so it's it's probably going to be picking the colors that there is the most of. That doesn't necessarily pick colors that your eyes are choosing to pull out of the picture. Because when I look at that picture, I see navy blue and I see um, sort of purpley pink and I see a lot of um, gray and grayish green and teal actually. And none mm -hmm. of those colors have appeared for me in my color picker. Um, <laughs> but that's just because as an artist, you're going to see things differently to how they're represented photographically. And that's actually a superpower, not a hindrance. That's true. That is true. And everybody sees color a little bit differently, which I find fascinating. Exactly. My husband is very colorblind. And I love it. It's one of the best <laughs> things. Yeah, um, men are more likely to have some level of uh, color impaired yeah. vision. <laughs> yeah. The best thing about it is that he doesn't have this paradigm of color that we have. So if he's going to choose a color that he likes. He might choose a color that the average Joe is going to think is absolutely rancid. And it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. It's, he uh, appreciates colors that might otherwise go unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and then do you okay. get the free reign with um, like home decor choices, paint colors, all of those things? Yep. Yep, exactly. And it's it's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I called this color palette the Yorkshire Ripper because I was watching that the Ripper documentary on Netflix while I was <laughs> practicing for this live. So please um don't judge me. <laughs> Addie and I were talking I about the other the other day that if you're painting a specific thing or you're listening to specific music while you're doing something, then that seems to always trigger that exact thing next time you look at the picture or paint the thing or listen to the music. It's very, Definitely. yeah. What do they say? Well, it's a limbic memory. Ooh. Isn't that what it's called? I, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to defer to you there. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's like that thing where if you ate a hamburger that made you vomit, you might never eat a hamburger again. Yes. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, okay, it wasn't. So, yep. I was going to say, I once, I once got um, 
fooled, let's say, into eating uh, cow's tongue, which a lot of people enjoy, um, but not knowing what it was until after I'd eaten it. Um, yeah, that's that's trickery. That's not nice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's one of those things that I, I could never entertain. Never mind that I'm vegetarian now, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I remember my mom used to cook tripe, which is like guts um, of cow. Ooh, yeah. And it's got the texture of a carpet. And our neighbor came to visit and he said, um, what is that? And my mom told him she was boiling a carpet. And he went home and he told his mom. <laughs> As if we weren't weird enough already. Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, the um, the range of foods that people eat around the world, um, especially when you look back in time, it's just so interesting how, you, like, <laughs> flavor is a social construct. <laughs> yeah, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean... Vegemite is a case in point. Yeah. So not being from Australia, do you eat Vegemite? I actually love Vegemite because there is Marmite in South Africa and it's pretty much the same. And okay. Bovril. Bovril. Bovril is just basically the meat version of Vegemite, but it's actually not made out of meat. It just tastes meaty. Hmm. And I love Bovril. Um, English people have bovril too. So are you still using all the same brush here? Yes, this is all the same brush. I haven't swapped out at all. Okay, so I'm just patting together. And, and this, I'm going to use you, the smudge brush. For smudge, I always use Remind us which brush you're painting with. Oh, I was using, um, what's it called? Wet, blunt wet oil. Okay, and you were just varying the size to get these. Yeah, changes. yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to add a bit of smudging here. Okay, now let's paint. Oh, let's first do the little house and the fence. So the house is sort of like a bluey that color. Let us know in the chat if you're following along um, and if you're painting a different scene, feel free to drop yeah. a link or just tell us where it is that you're painting. Oh, yes. I, I went down the rabbit hole so far with that map crunch. I literally went on tour everywhere, <laughs> went all over the world. I was looking at everything and I've decided there are so many places I need to go in this blasted disease has lifted. Oh, yes, I I think what's really cool about this site is that it pulls you into places that are off the beaten path that you wouldn't normally yeah. see when you're looking and researching places to go. Um, like this this town in Belgium. Who, who knows where in Belgium this is? <laughs> this one I found because on MapCrunch there's a gallery where people have put pretty stuff. And somebody very kindly put this lovely little house on a little rural road in there and, and the I timing thought, jackpot yeah it is, if it's like sunrise or yeah probably sunrise yes. just like what amazing timing one the one of the places that I painted a few things of is a place that Addie's been to called Lesotho it's a mountain kingdom in Africa and it was so cool they've got lovely things to paint there if you're ever interested in painting Lesotho. And if you're ever interested in traveling there too, it's a beautiful country to visit. It's a landlocked yeah. within South Africa. Yeah. It's a it's a unique little place. Okay, yeah. now let's do this roof. So I I wonder if anybody has noticed how slapdash I'm being. Um but I think when you're painting a plain air 
fake plain air scene, you kind of want it to look spontaneous and uncomplicated and under um, fussed. You you don't really want it to look like you've you've farted around for hours getting it perfect. Yeah, because um, you sort of want an impression of what you're painting, not a photo. And what I really like in this loose style is that you are like sculpting the painting almost. So you're starting out with these broad strokes and then kind of carving out the detail as you go, which um, it just results in, I think, an even more hyper-realistic digital oil painting. Yeah, because you, you're pushing away things that aren't important and you're pulling out things that are. Yeah, that sort and you of, can... Um, impressionist style. And you get to make the decision. So if there's anything you leave out yes. from the photo, that's your that's your say. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Gail Not asked, every twig is important. Yeah. Gail asked if you're using transparency, uh, changing the opacity um, as you're blocking in the color, or are you doing this all on full opacity? This is all on full opacity. The reason you can see the drawing is because it's on top. So I've got the drawing on top so that I can still see it. But some of these colors sort of smudge into each other as you go. And that um, that sort of makes it look like the opacity is, is um, being changed as well. Yeah. OK. Let's go back here and make it a little bit bigger. Um, now, once you've got the gist of what you're doing down, hang on, this little bit here is missing. Uh, then you can paint the sky. Hang on, I first want to do these wires. I don't know why, but I think that um, telephone wires in plain air sketches absolutely make it. They just seem like they make it so that you feel like you're actually there. So I leverage the telephone wire at every opportunity. I love the telephone wires. <laughs> yeah. And it adds to the perspective that you're creating without sort of over emphasizing that you're trying to make a disappearing point. Um, okay, now the sky. I'm still with the same brush. I haven't swapped brushes yet. Same so brush, sky, but different layer, right? Yes, different layers. So I've got my detail -y bit here. See, that's my little house and a couple of twigs. Um, this layer is the bulk of my landscape. And then the back, the last layer is going to be the sky. So I'm going to proof in the whole thing with blue like that. I'm not going to be too panicked about it. And then I want to grab some white. I'm going to make the brush a tiny bit smaller. And again, do your squinty eyes and see, okay, we've got a bit of a cloud doing this. And I've got a big lot of white over here with a bit of stuff happening there. Okay, and don't get too precious about how you're doing this because stuff changes and you can change it as you go. Okay, next, skies. Whenever I paint skies, I always use the smudge tool because it has this lovely um, ability to pull things back towards the cloud and push little tendrils of cloud out as you as you go so this is just like a wizardry to me i made a reel on instagram that shows me painting clouds but it goes so fast that it it actually shows nothing. I think <laughs> I should have made it slightly slower. 
<laughs> I just I panic though with those Instagram things. They only last like 20, 30 seconds. And how much can you actually show in 30 seconds? Yeah. How do it, people it can have entire tutorials? Yeah. Well, and you can't okay. pause it as the viewer. No, you can't. You just gotta watch it again and again. Yeah, you just <laughs> get caught in the endless loop. Um, smudge tool, you always tend to use the brush tacular, correct? Yes, I do like brush tacular for smudging because it's sort of hairy and it gives you a bit of that, um, like uh, it pulls a few lines of color and leaves others behind. Um, but if I want to smudge something s radically, like smear a thing from one place to another, I'll definitely use a wetter kind of brush for that okay. because um, this one doesn't pull an enormous amount of pigment around. I suppose yeah, I like the control of that. A lot of the texture. Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you can see that as I'm pulling like this, If I want to go back and make a little bit of clear sky there, I can push backwards through the white. It's uh, that's something I like about being able to smudge the clouds. And you painted the clouds and the the blue on the same layer, correct? Yes. So can you see this okay. layer's got? Let's hide that. It's it's a bit of a mess layer, but that covers it. It's fine. Okay, so we're getting there. Let's make this a little bit bigger and then we can get some straight lines. Right, I think we're done on the sky. Now, I'm gonna show you something that will blow your socks off. I'm so it, it looks okay, it looks, it looks decent-ish. Hang on, I just think I just need to add a little bit more of dark gray something over here so yeah this i know that's not the right color it's a bit darker. <laughs> deb um, asked we saw a glimpse of an animal yes my cat pokey who um <laughs> she's in a, a cone this like weird inner tube cone and a bodysuit because she has <laughs> allergies um <laughs> and intends to over groom so she's in this all this protective <laughs> get up um <laughs> But she, uh, she is a she's such a cute thing <laughs> she's just oh i'm sorry she's big she makes <laughs> she makes me laugh so much and Shame. She's a little boy with her little she's a nub for a tail oh you're okay <laughs> so loved <laughs> uh abby got a puppy oh yes his name is Nicholas. I don't know where he is at the moment. Somewhere else. Aww. Okay. So we've got a little bit of a painting going. Um, now it looks a bit sort of haphazard and, and squishy. So if you want to make it look like you've done multiple tiny, very deliberate brush strokes, you can hack that. So what I'm going to do is duplicate this layer that I've painted, just in case I mess it up. And I'm going to go here to the glitch effect and choose layer. Now we don't want the artifact glitch because that is not useful to us. We're going to go to the diverge glitch, the one on the extreme right. And we don't actually want the colors to separate from each other because this is what it looks like if the colors separate, which is pretty yeah. in its own way, but it looks very digital. But what I want to do is I want to put all of these color sliders on zero, which can be a bit tricky um, to do. But if you want more control over a slider, put the pencil on the slider and then slide it. And while sliding it, move the pencil further and further away from the slider on the screen and you'll so gain up, more control. 
upward in this case? Yes. Okay. That's very cool that it works on those sliders. Um, for anybody yes. who didn't know, um, the pulling it away from the slider trick also works for brush size and brush opacity if you need to be yeah. more uh, precise. Yes, sort of the increments begin to um, become smaller the further the pencil is sliding on the screen. Okay, now let's glitch this and see how suddenly, if we make the glitch smaller, it looks like you've done lots of choppy little brush strokes. So we can really game this so that it looks like we've done tons of little strokes. That's and amazing. We actually haven't. Um, the little um, glitches will appear um, in little blocks parallel to the bottom of your screen. So if you actually want those blocks to be vertical, you can swivel your painting and move the slider, and then you can see the little glitchy blocks actually go parallel to the opposite edge, like that. But I think I prefer them more parallel to the bottom in this instance. And I can do that. Another thing you can do is if you want to only do this effect in a small area, you can use the paintbrush to select the area you're glitching in. So um, let's leave that like that and go to this one, do another one and show you that way. So glitch, and then instead of layer, choose pencil, and then you'd have to go back and um, move all your sliders to zero again. Deb says, what a neat trick. It is a neat trick. It, it is very cool. And I, I was saying to Abby, I hadn't figured out a way to use this particular filter. So I, I think this is a perfect use for it. So let's glitch it all the way up to 100 so we can see it and make the glitch size small. And then we can actually what have we on here? That's a good brush for it. We can add sort of leaf shapes to things if we don't feel like painting leaves in ourselves and maybe chop up the road a bit. This is so and brilliant. then put a couple more leaves over here, a little bit of a something happening there. So anyway, and that is a fun trick. Yep. I was going to say with if you're using the pencil filters, you can, if you add a little too much, you can go in with the eraser tool and remove just yep. a certain area as well. Yep. Um, I also do that with um, this, the with the whole layer. If you've glitched the whole layer, but you still have your duplicate layer beneath, let's delete that other one. So the duplicate layer is the one that you haven't glitched. And this is the one you have glitched. Let's say, for example, um, let's make this um, eraser the same one that we were painting with. Let's say you actually don't like the glitch over here because this one is below and unglitched. I mean, there you can go and erase here and it will show the below one, which isn't glitched. So that's another option. Yeah, I love that even uh, whether you're racing or not, just to have the backup just in case. Yes, yes, I do like to have the backup um, yeah. because the undo tool, I, I, like, I mean, as soon as you leave a canvas, your options to undo things are eliminated. So that's yes. a bit stressful. Okay, so this is a bit messy, but this was a quick one just to show you. Um, so we're going to do the glow where that sun is in that nice focal point at the top right. So we'll go to a layer above all of them. And uh, that glow is sort of an orangey yellow. We'll go and pick a orangey yellow color like that. And then I'm just going to make a circle there. and hit Gaussian. Oh, that looks, that looks good. And then set it to add. Oh. That's pretty extreme, looks good. 
Like we it could looks probably so we could probably make it glow even more by making it more diffused. So let's go Gaussian again and see if it looks better, bigger. No, I think it actually looks better when it's little. And then we it's can It's so impactful. Drop and the opacity if it's a bit too punchy. What I think is striking about this is how much more vibrant the painting is. Yes, it suddenly adds some light to it and makes it feel like it's an actual place. Yeah, and then well, and the thing... overall, between your color yeah. choices and then adding the sunburst, the, the two combined just make it so much more lively. But you can still see very much that it's a, a, the same uh, inspired by that spot. Yeah. So you don't have to choose very, very local color. You can abstract the color a little bit and still get the vibe of a place. In fact, I often, this is another thing that I do, is you see this um, pink here, this sort of bubblegum pink. It's mm -hmm. a color that is that advances. So I don't know if you've ever done color theory where they say warm colors advance, cool colors recede, etc. There are some colors that I semi disagree with them. I think turquoise advances massively. And I think that um, mustard yellow, although it's supposedly a warm color, recedes a lot. So I think there's some um, exceptions to those rules. But one of my favorite colors to just add a sort of a cooling and an advancing effect is this bubble gummy pink. And the brush that I use is thick oil because you can actually use it as a glaze. It's probably the only brush in these sets that you can use as a glaze because you can slide the um, opacity slider and it will still, it will look like a film of um, color over the top. And then I add a few little, so for example here, the road has got these little blings on it. You can add some excitement to things without going over the top. But, and there isn't really bubblegum pink in the actual photograph, but that doesn't matter because you're not using it as a local color. You're using it as a bit of a highlight. Okay, this is this is all new to me, this terminology of advancing or receding. And DMB's art studio um, says value is important in colors advancing or receding, yeah. which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the amount yeah, of- So if there's- black or white in the color. Yeah, so I would guess that black would cause the colors to recede and white would cause them yeah. to advance. Yeah, so the saturation is probably more important than the tone of whether it's a warm or a cool color. I find that a little bit too simplistic when they teach that at school and at, <laughs> at art school. So in this layer, I'm just going to add a few little pink things and then I'm going to add a few little dark blue gray things where I am. Um, this is very cool to me because um, it, uh, I was going to say it, reminds me of our conversations about painting white and how white is never truly white. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and we're so often tricked into believing something is a color just because academically we know that's the color that it is. Meanwhile, it yeah. doesn't look that way at all. Um, Abby, your mic seems to be giving you robot voice. Oh, oh um, am I touching the, am I touching, am I touching this box, box as, as it's lying next to better, better? It's worse. worse, worse. <laughs> Let me know if it's just me or if this is. No, no, maybe, maybe it's a machine. machine. Now we can't hear you at all. <laughs> 
better. Much. Unmute. Much better. I can hear you now. Okay. Much, much better. But I can't hear you now, so that is no good. Hang on. Okay. Much better. Can you hear us or me? Built in no? microphone. Microsoft. Okay, is it working now? Yeah, can you hear us? Or yes, I, I can hear us? you. And, and okay, is, good. It, is it robotic yes. again? No, much clearer. Brilliant. Unplug and replug. The old tactic. That's always the trick. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> where am I? So I'm just adding a, li a little bit of a glaze of this navy blue. And then I'm going to set this layer to overlay. And it allows me to do more of what we were talking about earlier, of the pushing things backwards and pulling things forward. Yeah, something else to keep in mind as you're adding these, these glazed bits um, for, the, for the audience as well. You can choose to have uh, your highlights be cooler colors, um, yeah. but to balance that out, you would want your shadows to be warmer. So in this case, yes. you're doing warm highlights and cool shadows, but you can invert yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, you can. Anyway, so I think I'm done. What do you think? Beautiful. Oh, I think it's gorgeous. Um, do you want me to show a few other things, other um, landscapes that I've done using uh, map crunch images? Yeah, I think um, if you're keen to share time lapses of some of the, um, I think of like the mountainscape that I made the thumbnail with, yeah. um, that can give us some more insight into that process. Cool. Are there any questions? Um, I think we've been answering them as we go, but leave any questions you guys might have about the brushes, painting, landscapes in general, anything that you have in the chat. Um, Natalie says, yes, show us. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I actually made a time lapse. Oh, this is me farting around for a bit. Oh, yeah, there. Okay, I painted a pear and <laughs> then I decided I hated it. Okay, there we oh. go. There's the time lapse of this mountainscape. This one wasn't from Map Crunch. I remember this was a photo that somebody had put on um, what's it called? Unsplash. Okay. I love this. Yeah, this was a challenge because the trees actually, there's this sort of light area below the trees. It's almost like there's a, a plain between the trees and the um, river. And trees are an absolute nightmare to paint. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know it watching this time lapse. Um, I love the reflection of the sky and the water here. And then, oh my goodness, it's so cool to see how you added that, that rich blue underneath the trees that are more in the foreground. Yeah, this one I think I just, um, hacked the colors I didn't use the colors from the image um let's find another and then the, the fog in the background too is such a good touch uh this one oh oh this one I was testing out some little leaf brushes as well so you'll see some little splattery things happening so can you see um how do I pause? No, I have to. You, you can't pause while you, oh, you slide here. Um, you can see at about this point, I'm just blocking in the tonal areas. So I'm going for the water, the rocks, the leaves, and I'm not fussed about it being too detailed at this point. And here I'm starting to add a little bit more detail. This was another unsplash image. I think it was on the first page when you search the word landscape. Very handy. <laughs> so, yeah, this was me battling with leaves. 
Can you see? I think I even paint over those leaves because I didn't like them. And water is a really interesting thing to paint because of it's like transparent as well as being reflective, as well as looking like it's moving, um, as well as being blue but not blue. Um, yeah, it's a whole thing. And it looks like you did all horizontal strokes, giving you that cool ripple effect. Yeah, I think I start to mess with it later with a smudge tool. I'm not sure. Um, our trees are a really nice thing to add in if you want to um, just add a an element to a landscape that's very um, loggy. I mean, sorry, rocky and blobby. A tree will add a bit of structure and it'll kind of ground your landscape. You, for example, you know how if you're looking at something very close up, you can't really tell what it is until you put a match next to it. It's that sort of, it It brings scale to things and you can go, ah, okay, that's a rock, not a mountain. Yeah, now that you, you say that, I think it's really interesting how very little is actually defined in this painting. And so you have the tree, yeah. the waterfall, and some of the yeah. bushes, but then you've so much of the background that stayed abstract. Yeah. Uh, this one is... This was a tormenting me nine mountainscape. It really, it was very difficult to paint. I don't know why. I, I took hours and it actually didn't turn out. Oh, that's anything. That like is the worst. <laughs> yeah. I have a mountainscape that I was trying to do um, in advance of this session that I felt the same way about. <laughs> and it just became overworked, which I think is yeah. just a sign yeah. to stop. <laughs> So what I did was when it was starting to bother me, you can see here, I just did the glitch effect and then did it again and I did it again because it was just, I couldn't resolve. And then it turned out actually okay in the end. Um, yeah. And then this one is in Utah. Ooh, I've been there. And... Oh, this was, sorry, hang on, let me show you something. This is a cool way to make um, color palettes. So I drew the color palette from um, an image. And then I did that thing that somebody told us the other day where you swoop up from the bottom right of the screen with your pencil to make the screenshot. And yeah. I screen I screenshot the palette. So where is it? Yeah there then i i i made it full screen and i put it on top of a duplicate of it and set the blend mode to overlay to get a more saturated version of the same palette so it's flashing a lot but at this point that that's what i'm doing can you see i don't yeah. end up using this palette in this painting but that's how you create a super it was for this painting but it was that's how you create a super saturated palette for um, an image or from an image if you want to do that. So this- Yeah, that's um, a handy trick. Yeah. Uh, Deb asks, can you glitch horizontally and then glitch again vertically? You, if you do the glitch horizontally, you have to go out of glitch and then go back in to do it on the same glitched thing. But or if you, it if you swivel it and then- Yes, you have to hit apply. If you um, slide the slider, it will immediately change it to the opposite way. Okay. So that, oh, in this one, you can see that I um, blocked in the mountain area because it was giving me trouble that um, every time I painted it, I was like, um, losing I couldn't define which was the mountain and which was the grass just from my drawing so I blocked it in so that I wouldn't um, make that mistake again and then I painted it like that oh wow you can see um, the road the road in this image saves it because there's no um, distinction of scale in this picture if you just look at that it could be somebody's very craggy foot or yes. you know, <laughs> yeah, no, it, stone, or just a small rock. <laughs> yes, but the road gives it scale. 
Anyway, yes, what's the question? Um, yes, Deb asked if you could repeat, um, if you could actually demonstrate that dragging the pencil across the screen from below to upper right for a screenshot. So oh, this sure. is a trick that we learned on our last live stream, live stream Deb, from um, somebody in the chat. And yeah, you just drag from, from the lower left yeah. with your Apple Pencil up towards the right and it'll automatically take a screenshot. Like that, hang on, let's just go down. I'll show you again. Ta-da! Very handy. And then one of my oh, favorite Luffy things tunes. about this, this way of doing this is you can, um, you can choose, oh, actually, I only want to screenshot this little bit here and save to photos. Yes, I love that. So, cool. Uh, is there anything else that I can show you that's exciting? Um, <laughs> I can, I mean, no. I can show my very overworked mountainscape here. Yes, um, yes, let's see yours. Let me make sure I have a time lapse. Oh, okay. Right, so I'm still not happy with it. Um, that's interesting. I think I must have cropped it and the time lapse shows it with the black bars. But I was trying, I don't have a lot of experience with landscapes and I maybe chose just an overly complex one. Um, but I think, I think where I could improve is uh, going larger at the beginning and then going smaller at the end. Cause I kind of jumped around back and forth, small and large, small and large. And it just got to a point where I didn't really know what I was doing anymore. It's lovely. Let's speed this up a bit. Then I started to add more layers and <laughs> it gets really, there's a lot going on by the end here. Yeah, I this think is... that um, something that um, applies to all observational drawing or painting or art is that you all you're doing is transferring what you're seeing onto the page. So relying on what you think you're seeing is very unreliable. Looking at things and breaking it down into the shapes that you're seeing and what color they are and how they relate to the shape next to them is going to be the best way to transfer what you're seeing into what you want to paint. That is that such good sense? advice. Yes. Yeah. So instead of going, oh, I know it's a mountain and draw and painting the mountain, um, going, hang on, that rock is sort of a rectangle next to a little triangle and it's a bit darker than the triangle. Let's do that and doing that one little bit at a time. So you almost uh, flesh it out like a puzzle instead of having, the, you know, having an idea of what it's supposed to look like in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also thinking of things, and this is something I still struggle to wrap my brain around sometimes in um, three-dimensional form. So not just a rectangle, but a box and not just a yeah. triangle, but a prism uh, or a pyramid, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's really lovely. like the forever challenge. Hey, I think I've looked at it too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens. And you just never want to see it again. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Then, I, would, I would really love to see the things that people paint after this. Yes. Um, let me drop our Instagram handles. Uh, tag us on Instagram if you paint and post anything from here. Um, yeah. The link for the brushes and the color palette that we used today are all in the description. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining and painting yeah. with us. And this yeah, will be available lovely. for you afterward. Yeah, and but let us know if there's anything you um, didn't understand. Just message Addy or I and we can help you. And um, yeah, and tag us and let us know what else you'd like to learn about. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye.